Good morning again. It is Sunday, August the 1st, 2021. And uh, we have been dealing with um, COVID-19 now for just about a year and a half. And COVID-19 has um, drastically changed some of the things that we do. And it's going to drastically change some of the things that we do in the church from here on. And, um, but I have also said more than once that I believe that COVID-19 has been a call from God for the church of God to stop and look at what it's doing and to see if we are doing what God wants us to do or whether we are doing what we uh, feel that we should do or we are comfortable with doing. Last week, uh, I talked about uh, the call of Paul to ministry and what drove him in ministry. In other words, what was his motivation? And we looked at um, the parable that Jesus told in John chapter 10 uh, about the hireling. And uh, we must realize that there are people who are involved in ministry for other motives than the pure motive of uh, ministering the word of God to people. It is very easy for us as human beings to have other, other motivations, other reasons why we do things. Uh, we do that so often, and sometimes we are unaware of the motive that is behind what we are doing. Sometimes we are doing things for a strictly spiritual reason, or we think we are, but really underneath of it all is a, a material reason why we're doing those things. But Paul says that he was given a stewardship or that he was giving, given a dispensation, as it says in the King James. Um, and we looked at what that meant. Now, we didn't uh, in any in detail, uh, and that's for another message that is coming up. But today, I want to look at the aspect of the when of ministry. We looked at the why last week. This week, I want us to look at the when. In other words, why is ministry today such an important issue? Uh, what is it about the culture of today that forces us? to um, or should force us to think differently and to question what we are doing and to see if what we are doing is truly what God wants us to do. I've been dealing a lot lately with uh, um, some distraction. It's hard to go through life undistracted. And uh, I've had some personal distractions over the last few weeks, the last couple of months, health-wise as well as uh, um, house-wise. And uh, so sometimes I feel very pressed for time. And um, when it comes to putting a message together, uh, there are times when I'm feeling very pressed and I'm feeling like I haven't had the time that I've needed to give to uh, preparing for a message. Now, there are some people that believe that all a minister does is go to a book and take out of a book uh, a sermon idea, and that's it. Uh, I can't do that. For me, I want to make sure that what I say comes from God that it is true to the heart of God. And in order to do that, that means I have to spend hours a week in prayer, getting my heart in the place where it is properly aligned with, with God. So then what I am saying actually comes from God, doesn't come from me. And then I have to sit down and I have to study and kind of prepare. And many times that means going into the Greek uh, and studying out of a multitude of books. Um, and that all takes time. 
I, I'm not telling you this to say that you uh, should be sympathetic with me or anything like that. I, this is just the norm that happens uh, when we, as pastors, prepare for a men- prepare for a message. Now, there have been times when I have done the preparation, and then at the very last moment, even as I'm approaching the pulpit, the Lord has laid it upon my heart to do something totally different. And I have learned to follow his leading. However, I want you to understand that it is important that I have that time to prepare, because if I don't have that time to prepare, then there's not much that I can share with you. And so what I want to share with you today isn't about my sermon preparation or anything like that, but it is about the whole idea of being prepared. Because in Matthew chapter 25, the first 13 verses, Jesus tells a parable about this man who is getting married Uh, Actually, the parable isn't about the man getting married. The parable is about the young women who were hired uh, in order to lead the procession from the bridegroom's house to the bride's house and then back uh, so that they could consummate the, so that they could have the wedding and then have the wedding feast. And um, Five of these are described as wise, and five are described as foolish. And we'll get into that uh, here in a few minutes. But I want us to focus on that parable, because that parable has a lot to say about where we as a church need to be today and what our focus needs to be, especially in these days. Well, let's unpack Um, Matthew chapter 25. In the first five verses, we find that the, or we're introduced to these 10 virgins. Now, it starts out by saying, in that time or at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like. Now, when it says at that time, it is referring to what takes place before, uh, because it is setting the time uh, of the what is going to go on. And if you go back to chapter 24 and verse 36, you will find there that Jesus says that the only the Father knows when the time of the coming of Christ will be. He says the angels have no clue about it. And he even claims that he does not even know himself when this time will be, but only the Father. It is totally the prerogative of the Father when that time will come. Without getting too technical here, um, we need to understand what what, uh, Jesus is saying. We need to understand why he says that even he does not know. Because that sounds like Jesus is not claiming to be God, not claiming to have the knowledge that God has. To give you the short answer, and without, like I said, getting too technical, I want to tell you that there are at least eight Greek words that we translate by the one word uh, in, um, in English, to know. And so there are eight different Greek verbs that we translate the same way. And this is what causes our problems sometimes in understanding what the Bible actually means. There are two very common words that are used. The first one 
is the Greek word gnosko, okay? Gnosko. The second one is the Greek word or the Greek verb oido. Whenever you see a word ending with the O in Greek, it signifies that it is a verb. And so we have this verb gnosko, and we also have this verb oida. Now, gnosko refers to the inception or the process of knowing. In other words, when we're talking about the inception of it, that there is a starting point to this idea of knowing. Before that point, it was unknown. But from that point on, it is known, or you're getting to know that concept. It also has with it the idea of progressing towards an understanding. But the thing that is important for our understanding of this is that Gnosko always has a beginning and is a process. Oida, on the other hand, does not speak of a beginning. Oida suggests a fullness or a perfection of knowing that is not dependent upon a beginning or a process. It is the perfect way that God knows us. It is the perfect way that God knows anything. Gnosko is the human way that we get to know things. And so when Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, says that only the Father knows, he uses oida. And when he says that he as a son does not know, he's using gnosko. And so he's saying that in his human form, he does not know. He has not yet begun to understand. Um, whereas in his divine form, oida, he instinctively knows. He perfectly knows because God perfectly knows all things. And so what we have here is his idea of Christ in his human form. And he's speaking about his human form. That there is a limitation to the human form in the fact that we do not know things perfectly like God does. And we have to have a starting point and a progression in our understanding. This is also seen in John chapter 13 and verse 7, where Jesus says about God, you have not known him. Okay, you have not known him. Gnosko. You have not yet begun to understand God. But I know him. Oida. I know him perfectly. because of my divinity. So in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus is basically saying that only the Father knows that day perfectly. And that he himself in the flesh is limited as we are limited in understanding when that day will be. Now, he is not saying that he does not know it perfectly in his divine form but in his human form he can only know it from a point of beginning and through its progression so that is important for us to understand when we talk about what god knows and when we talk about the second coming of christ and when that's going to be because god knows perfectly when that time is we as human beings, and even Jesus in his human flesh, 
said there are limitations to our understanding of when that time will be. This is important to help us to understand this parable that Jesus tells about these uh, 10 virgins. It says that 10 virgins took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, this is couched in so much of the culture of Jesus' day. And I want you to understand that a wedding in Jesus' day was a protracted thing. Many times today, the wedding takes place in one day. That's not the way it took in the normal culture of Jesus' day. It actually started roughly a year before, usually a year before, when the father of the groom went to the father of the bride and indicated that the groom was interested in marrying the bride. Um, and the two fathers sat down and determined what the price was going to be. Because in that culture, uh, that was so dependent upon having large families in order to provide uh, sustenance for the whole family. If you lost a person, then that was a material loss. And so in marrying uh, off a daughter, the father of the bride actually loses something. And therefore, there needs to be compensation. Now, we don't like that in today's society, but that was the culture back then. And so they agree upon a price, and then the two are considered to be betrothed or engaged. And the engagement usually takes a year. And during that year, they are seen as being married when they haven't officially been married. They're considered a married couple, um, but they haven't actually gone through the wedding itself. The wedding usually takes place a year later. Now, something else about this that is very important for us to understand. In today's culture, it's all about the bride. In the culture that Jesus lived in, the wedding's not about the bride. The wedding is about the bridegroom. And so the emphasis is based or is put on the bridegroom. And as part of the what takes place is the day of the wedding, the only obligation the bride has to do is to be ready for when the bridegroom comes. In our society, the wedding doesn't go forward until the bride says it goes forward. Uh, and more often than not, we wait for the bride. In this culture, you waited for the bridegroom, not the bride. And the bridegroom on that day would make a journey from his home to the home of the uh, bride at which they would exchange a very quick ceremony uh, and therefore be considered married. And then he would take her back to his house or back to his parents' house, and they would have a celebration that lasted up to seven days. This is why in John chapter 2, that when Jesus is at the wedding feast in Cana, that Mary comes to him and says they have run out of wine. It's more than likely that this was a family wedding and the person being married, uh, the bridegroom that was being married, uh, was a relative of Mary. Because the bridegroom and his family bore the expense of a whole week of celebration. You didn't send them away at night to go to a motel. No. And you fed them for seven straight days. And it would be a shame for you to run out of wine. 
And so we get this picture of Jesus being at this wedding feast. That is the final stage of the wedding. And so we find here in this parable that these 10 virgins are waiting for the coming of the bridegroom. The bridegroom hasn't yet come from his place to go to the brides, nor to take the bride back to his place where the celebration will continue for seven days. And so they're waiting. And it tells us that they waited a long time because it tells us at midnight, the call went out. Okay. So we're not sure when they started waiting, but they've been waiting for a long time. And these 10 virgins, five of them only took their lamps with the oil in it. Five of them took their oil lamps with the oil in it, plus they also took a flask or a container that contained extra oil just in case they had to wait a long time before this procession took place. So we find in um, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 6 that the call finally comes that the bridegroom is on his way. So they have spent all this time waiting. While they've been waiting, they have nodded off. I used to laugh at my grandfather when I'd go to visit him because we'd be sitting there in the living room, maybe watching TV, and he'd be on the couch, uh, you know, uh, kind of leaning back on the end of the couch, and all of a sudden I'd see his head go forward or his head go back, and I knew that he drifted off. In other words, he had ceased being attentive. That was the first thing that happened in this long period of waiting, that they be, started to become inattentive. The second thing that happened was that they literally fell asleep. They went into a solid sleep. In the middle of that, the call came that the bridegroom was coming. And so we moved from the waiting to the wanting. And I call this the wanting because when they heard the call, they get ready, they get up and ready themselves uh, in order to lead this procession because that was their job to lead the procession, um, to light the way to the bride's place and then back home. And we find that um, that these five virgins who were what we call wise took oil with them now why are they considered wise well the greek word that is used here for wise means prudent or to be practically wise they understood that the bridegroom might be late in coming so they were prepared for the bridegroom to be late in his coming. The other five were not prepared. They were not prepared for a long stay. And when they get up and they start trimming the lamps, all of a sudden their expression was, our lamps are going out quick. We need help. And, um, but the, it, it's interesting that the Greek word that is used here to describe these five is the Greek word moros, M-O-R-O-S. Now, to understand its meaning, all you have to do is take the final, you take the S off the end and put an N in its place. So we have M-O-R-O-N, moron. And we get the English word moron from this Greek word. This Greek word moros means to be sluggish or to be dull, especially in thinking, hence to be stupid. Or foolish. So it's to be sluggish. To not be prepared is the idea behind it. It, it's, it carries with it an idea of morally being worthless. Not because you lack morals, 
but it's a moral worthlessness because you did not prepare as you should have prepared. And so the connection here is between the failure to be prepared and the fact that they were foolish or worthless. It's not a lack of morals. It's a lack of preparation. And so the five were lazy, unprepared, while the other five were prudent and therefore well prepared. And that's what sets them apart. So they had nodded off, they had gone to sleep, and, and all of a sudden the call comes. And they now face um, a, a grim possibility. Because you need to understand that the role that they played was that they would carry these lamps and light the way to the home of the bride and then back to the home of the bridegroom. And now we have five who do not have enough oil. In fact, their, their lamps were beginning to go out. They had used up all of the oil. And so they turn to the other five and they say, give us some of your oil. And the response that the wise ones give seems a little harsh to us, but it's really not. They look and they say, no, we can't give you our oil. We can't share our oil with you because there is the possibility that if we share our oil with you, that not only will you fail to do your job, but we will also fail to do our job because our oil will also run out. And so the five foolish virgins have to go in the middle of the night to find somebody who will sell them oil in order to replenish the oil in their lamps. When they get back, much time has passed because the scene has shifted from the, the coming of the bridegroom in going to the uh, bride's house now they are back at the bridegroom's house celebrating this wedding feast. And so they go to the door and they knock on the door and the bridegroom says, I didn't know you. I don't know you. And bars them from coming in. So then Jesus gives us a warning and he tells us that we need to be prepared for the coming of Christ. And we as a church, uh, as a North American church, as a church universal, I think that to some degree, <clears throat> many of us have nodded off. We've become unattentive. And many of us have actually fallen asleep. Does that mean? that therefore we won't get into heaven because this parable is about these five virgins who were unprepared and therefore were barred from the wedding feast. I want to share with you three reasons why I do not believe that this has anything to do with our eternal reward. First, I want you to understand that this parable is told by Jesus before he was crucified, and that's important for us to understand. Of course, well, how would he tell the parable afterwards? But he tells it before, and therefore he is telling it to a group of religious people before he has paid the price for their sins. He is telling it to the Jews, not necessarily to Christians. And we must understand that in the epistles um, of the New Testament and also in the book of Revelation, that the bride or, or the, the church, those that are saved, is referred to as the bride of Christ. So therefore, 
it is important that we understand that those who have placed faith in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior make up the bride. They don't make up the wedding guests. The second thing that we need to understand is that um, there are two different groups that do form these guests. Um, and these people or, or these groups of people are different. The first is the angels. The angels watch and wonder at all of this. They don't fully comprehend and understand what God is doing. And so in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, Peter tells us that they watch in amazement at us and, and try to figure out what's going on. So they're going to be there. The second group are those who have responded appropriately to the invitation that has gone out uh, for this wedding banquet. And these people are the Jews who have placed their faith in, in God in the hope that someday the Messiah would be coming. If you look at Luke chapter 14, verses 16 to 24, which we don't have time to look at, you will find there that those that were given invitations, many of them found excuses groundless excuses for not attending uh, the wedding feast. And so therefore they were barred from the wedding feast. But there were others that did go in. Which brings us to the third thing. If the church is referred to as the bride, if there are two groups that we see that are going to be at the wedding feast, which are the angels, and the Old Testament saints, or those who responded appropriately before Christ died uh, to the message of the gospel, then we must understand that the church is not going to miss this. The church is going to be there because the church is the bride. And the other people that are going to be there are those who faithfully served God and trusted in God in the Old Testament era. So how is this then a warning to the church? Because it is a warning to the church. The reality is that this parable is a parable about being prepared for an event when, which we do not know when it's going to take place. And of course, understand that Jesus talks about this, that only the Father knows when it's going to take place. I want to tell you that at least three times in Paul's epistles, in Romans chapter 13 and verse 11, and in 1 Corinthians 15, 34, and Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14, Paul tells us that we need to be prepared. We need to wake up. The church has fallen asleep. The church has become inattentive. The problem is that when the church becomes comfortable, the church becomes inattentive. And so just as in Jesus' days, or just as in Jesus' day, um, when he told this parable, it is a warning to the church to not become inattentive. Throughout the history of mankind, God has been giving mankind warnings about what is going to come. God warned the Jews in the, in the time of the prophets, but the people preferred to ignore the message of the prophets and the warnings that they were giving and instead listen to prophets who told them what they wanted to hear. The northern tribes, therefore, went into captivity and were dispersed throughout the whole world. And you would think that the southern tribes would have learned their lesson. But about 150 years later, they too, 
had become so inattentive to God that, and so attentive to the warnings of prophets like Jeremiah, like Ezekiel, like Hosea. Instead, they listened to false prophets who told them what they wanted to hear. And because of that, God sent them into 70 years of captivity in Babylon. When God gives his modern day prophets warnings, when he speaks to his leadership, when he speaks to those that he has called to give warnings to the people today, he expects them to deliver those warnings to his people, even if the people won't hear it. And like Paul, many modern day prophets cannot help speaking what God tells them to speak because there is a necessity. They are obligated to speak and tell them what is what God is saying. And the church of today can close their ears and choose not to listen like the Jews did in the time of the prophets, like Jeremiah. But like the prophets, or like the people during the times of the prophets, if we close our ears to the warning, we will lose much. It is a great calling that we have, a great privilege to know God. But we must be careful not to become attentive and to fall asleep.